Well, Merry Christmas. I'm so glad that we're celebrating this whole month, the uh, coming of our Lord. And uh, I'm going to do a little, something a little differently today. And so um, you can follow along because most of what I'm going to be doing today is Scripture. And uh, I entitled my message, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And um, Jesus had already been started in his ministry when he went back to, uh, to Nazareth. Uh, I have been to Nazareth on several occasions. It is, um, it is not, it's, um, it's in Canaan, uh, outside of where the Jews normally spent time. But that's where Jesus uh, grew up. You know, he was born in Bethlehem, but he was only there because of a taxation that uh, Cyrenius had, had required for, for the people of Israel. But soon after the birth, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, went back to Nazareth where Jesus grew up. So uh, even when they came back as a, when he was 12 years old, they came from Nazareth back into Jerusalem uh, where uh, Jesus was, was in the temple instructing the, the rabbis, which uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, God has a real sense of humor sometimes. Uh, and fascinates us along the way. And when he was there, he, uh, he was there in the city, and, and uh, his ministry had taken him far from Nazareth. And so while he was there, the people asked the question, in fact, Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 and 50 to 57 says this, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his Mary called? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren? And it seems like at this point in time, his father had, or his stepfather Joseph had passed away. And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. See, G Jesus had brothers and possibly sisters, and so they were a normal family. Jesus. Uh, besides his miraculous uh, birth, was born into a normal family. And uh, Joseph, I think you're preaching on Joseph tonight, uh, Brother Matthew. Uh, Joseph, a wonderful man, because God entrusted his son and, and also was of the lineage of Abraham. But who is this Jesus? Is he not the carpenter's son? Is his mother not called Mary? His brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. And Jesus went on to say that no prophet has honor in his own country. The old saying, you can always go home. Well, sometimes, sometimes it's hard to go home. When God has done something in your life very special. Because most people don't understand it. But I want to give you an inside picture of Jesus today. I want to do an acrostic. An acrostic was where you take a name or take something and, and then you attach something else to it so you can remember it better. That's what an acrostic is. And so I'm going to take J, and I'll give you something for J. I'll give you something for E. I'll give you something for S. I'll give you something for U. And I'll give you something for S. And I think it describes Jesus 
beautifully. Now, I'm going to preach this in two different... I only have five points. I, I want to apologize to the Lord this morning, <laughs> but only five points. But he made it necessary. And just say to you that I'm going to use three points today and two points next Sunday. But who is Jesus? And, and if somebody comes to you and say, you know, who is this Jesus you follow? We know he's a good man. We know he's a good teacher. We know that he was a healer. There's a lot of characteristics about Jesus. He was a leader. But who is Jesus? Now, in a real sense, I, I wanted to put tag on the back of this, who is Jesus to me? But I thought, no, that's too restrictive. Because I believe that if you don't have this Jesus, you don't have Jesus. And so, let's start. J stands for Jehovah. Jehovah. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Jehovah God. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created out of, and he didn't, I'm putting in here, out of nothing the heaven and the earth. God created it all. He created it out of nothing. And if you stumble over this, or if anybody else stumbles over this, they do not understand Jesus. Jesus was not a child born to a man and a woman. Jesus is God. He's God. He's God from eternity past to eternity future. He's God. He was God in the beginning. He's God now. He's always going to be God. And he's nothing but God. Except God wrapped himself around human flesh. Jesus is God. Jehovah. Now, in Isaiah chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7, it says this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And we're talking about the coming of the Lord. So, so what Isaiah is doing is he's prophesying who this child will be. And I want you to listen very carefully what Isaiah says. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty Teacher? No. The Mighty Healer? No. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of his increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even for forever. Name another person ever upon this earth that you could say those things about. There are none. Who is Jesus? He's Jehovah. He's Jehovah God. And if Jesus is not Jehovah God in our lives, we do not know Jesus that we talk about. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. God sent his son. This is where it gets really interesting in the Trinity. God the Father sent his counterpart, Jesus, into the world. And Jesus sent his counterpart, the Holy Spirit, into the world when he left. But you have to understand... When Jesus came, he came to be 
God with us. And for 33 years, he tabernacled or he dwelt among us or he spent time with us on earth so that we could understand that Jesus not only is God, but he's God in flesh. He came to us as we are. Then in Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 to 35, it says this. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Nazareth, Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin, a spouse to a man or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her. And said, Hail thou that art mighty, mightily favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Can you imagine? I tell you, if an angel came to see me, I'd be a little amazed too, wondering what's going on. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Think for just a minute what the angel is saying. You have to understand Throughout the Old Testament, when angels sometimes appeared to men, they bowed down and the angel very quickly said, no, stand up. You don't bow to anybody but the Lord. They're talking about a special little baby that's coming. And and the angel said, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Why could not Jesus be born of a human? Well, it's very easy because medically speaking, the baby gets its blood from its father. When the sperm of the man and the egg of the woman are united and that sperm, that that egg is fertilized and begins to grow inside that baby, that blood that's there came from the father. That's why women take on the father's name and not vice versa until now. When perversion reigns. If Jesus had been born of a man, guess what? He would have been a sinner because his dad would have given him his sin, you see, in the blood. And his dad would have given him his sin and so forth and so on. He could not be born of a man because why? He would be a sinner just like us. I can't die for your sins. You can't die for my sins. It took someone who was perfect. And Jesus was not only perfect in his birth, he was perfect in his entire being. He had to be born of a virgin. When he shed his blood on Calvary, he was shedding not human blood, he was shedding what? Perfect blood. God's blood which can cover us and cover our sins. 
so he could become that innocent sacrifice. Just like a little lamb could cover the sin of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. John 14, 9 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me but the Father, but by me. Cometh unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. This is quite a rebuke, but it's, it's, it's strong enough for us to take notice. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? And he saith unto him, He that has seen the Father... Has seen, has seen me, has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? <clears throat> Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak of my, not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. <clears throat> Jesus is saying to Philip, now, he just got through in my father's house or many mansions. And Philip, you know, the disciples must have had blinders on. Because they spent a lot of time with Jesus. And here, Jesus is talking about heavenly things. And, and, and Philip says, show us the Father. He says, hey, dummy. You've been walking with me for all these years. I am the Father. I and the Father am one. And then in John chapter 17, in verse 11, it says, And now I am no more in this world. Now, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed. This is, this is literally. Now, we, we call our Father which art in heaven, we call that the Lord's Prayer, but that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's the disciples' prayer. That's the prayer Jesus taught the disciples to pray. But the Lord's prayer is found in John chapter 17. And he said, I, he, and this is in the midst of his prayer, he said, and now I am no more in, this wor in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Jesus is saying, I am not praying for me because I'm coming back to you. I'm praying for these that I'm leaving behind. I want them to understand. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. If Jesus Christ is not Jehovah, if Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, if Jesus Christ is not the Trinity, part of the Trinity, then he is a hypocrite, he's a liar, he's a fake, he's a fraud, and we're wasting our time meeting today. Jesus, number one, is Jehovah. Number two, E stands for eternal. Eternal. Jesus is not only Jehovah. Jesus is eternal. John chapter 1 and ver verses 1 to 4 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him is life, and the life was the light of men. In other words, what it's saying here is when eternity, be, when, when God began to make this world or to create this world, those words that were spoken 
Let there be light. Let the firmament divide itself from the water. All the way down to let us make man in our own, own image. That was the voice of Jesus. He's eternal. He's from the beginning to the end. He is eternal. We have to understand that. God is not just with us now. He has, he has known about us since the beginning of the world. The Bible says that, that whom he did know, he did, for, he did for, uh, predestinate. And so what we find is that in the very beginning, God knew that you would be in church today. He knew that you would be saved. He knew all the things about your life. He knew your ups, your downs, your sins, your faults. He knew your righteousness. He knew all, all that was to know about you. And when he knew that in eternity past, he not only wrote his na your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, but he also div divided every step that you're going to take, uh, laid out every step you're going to take. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, John wrote and he said, as we've studied, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden, uh, seven candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with garment, down to the foot, girt about the paps, paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice, the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth were, was, went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And hath the keys of hell and death. Jesus is eternal. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17 now unto King eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a great... And I could go on and on and on, you know. But I tried to choose those that would point out to us that God is not only... For Jesus is not only Jehovah, but he's also eternal. He wasn't here just for, he may have been on the earth for 33 years, but he's been here forever. No beginning, no end. Now the last thing we find is S stands for substitute. Jesus is our substitute. I'm going to read Isaiah 53. And I want you, as I go through this chapter of the Bible, I want you to envision Jesus. I want you to understand, this is a prophecy of Jesus 
being what Bill preached about, or sang about this morning. Jesus, as John told us, is the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb. And so, the first verse that I ever memorized that my mother taught me was John, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But here's what Isaiah says. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. That means simply that you probably wouldn't necessarily pick him out in a crowd. Because oftentimes Jesus blended into the crowd and they couldn't find him. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Do you wonder why that is? It's because we're not drawn to Jesus by outward appearance. We're drawn to Jesus by the Spirit of God. Jesus said, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we, re- we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes we were healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was born as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. A prophecy. But oh how true. How true. 
John chapter 1 verse 9, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I want you to think for just a second. A great preacher of old had this testimony. He said, I was, I was a wicked man before God saved me. I was stubborn. I was against God. No preacher ever moved me. But one day I, was, I went down some... Someone invited me to go down to the slaughterhouse. And I saw the animals being readied for the market. And they wanted me to experience taking the life of one of these animals. And they brought to me a little lamb and handed me the knife, sharp as a razor blade, to cut its throat. But as I lifted the knife, that little lamb looked at me and licked my hand with his tongue. He said, I dropped the knife. God struck my heart. What Jesus did for me is the Lamb of God on the cross. And I was soon converted. Jesus is our substitute. Should have been me. Should have been you. Should have been us. There's not one person that's ever been born into this world that didn't deserve to go to hell. We're sinners. But Jesus came to take upon himself on the cross of Calvary the wrath of God, the judgment of God, and the death that we should have. But because he died for us on the cross, he's able to give us eternal life. If we'll only trust him is our personal Savior. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 says this, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What a promise we have. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is our substitute. He died for me. He died for you. He took my place. Jesus a little acrostic that helps us learn about him, why he came, and how precious, more precious than gold, more precious than silver, more precious than money will ever be, is our Savior, our substitute, our eternal God, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
Our Father, there's no way that we can thank you for being who you are and doing what you've done for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for knowing us. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin and helping us to realize that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot do anything that measures to the righteousness that God demands. But you sent your only begotten Son on this time that we celebrate Christmas. The Eternal One, the One who spoke and the worlds came into existence. The Almighty One who holds this world together. You sent Him into this world to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, and then become our substitute our lamb that shed his blood that we might have eternal life and forgiveness of sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us. Father, in this invitation, if there's someone here this morning that needs Jesus as their personal Savior, may they feel the lick of the little lamb The touch of Christ. The recognition of what you did for us on the cross. And be willing to give their heart and their life to Christ this morning. I pray that there's some, if there's someone here that ought to become part of this ministry. That they be willing to do that. Then I also pray this morning if someone needs prayer. This is a tough time of the year for many people. And I pray that if there's someone here this morning that just needs someone to pray with them, that they'll be willing to do that. I pray that you'll bless the invitation. Our Father, speak to hearts this morning. Very quickly, I'd, I'd just like to ask, is there anyone here that says, I don't know Jesus as my Savior? Would you pray for me? Is there anyone like that? I'd like to go to heaven when I die. I want to be sure I'm saved. I want my sins forgiven. Would you pray for me? Anyone at all? all right. Father, bless this invitation. And may we realize that you are Jehovah, your God. You're eternal, and you're our substitute. We love you this morning, Lord Jesus. Do something in our hearts right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Brother Bill.